morning and good afternoon. Welcome to day six, the final day of the Scores Soccer Summit. Whew, <laughs> so excited to be here. My name is Angela Bailey coming to you from America Scores Bay Area, where we have worked with over 2,000 young students and partnered with over 80 different school sites in order to provide free soccer, poetry, and service learning programming. Across the country, America Scores works in 12 different cities, works with over 300 school sites, and trains and works with over 1,000 coaches. All this in order to provide service for 12,000 plus young poet athletes. I said poet athletes, yes, because these guys are learning life skills. They're expressing themselves on the field and in the classroom. We are so honored to have everybody here. We are so impressed with this lineup of incredible speakers. Shout out to Alicia Yano for putting together such a powerful panel and sessions this week. Hats off. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you so much to Women in Sports and Goal 5 for being our two lead sponsors, womeninsoccer.org. Go sign up. It's free membership. It grows your soccer network and it's growing our community. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to learn from the experts. We're, sh we're sharing their knowledge. We're all inspired. And then we're going to amplify the messages. So go help us join the community and grow the community. Also go to Goal 5 because it's apparel for her. They have beautiful it's innovative and we all know it's about time. So go to Goal 5, support them, and you could be the lucky winner today. Each session Goal 5 is giving out a prize. A randomly selected attendee is going to get a message saying they won a prize from Goal 5. So thank you, Goal 5. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Women in Sports. In true America Scores fashion, I am going to bring the poet athlete in the room and read you one of the poems from Chelsea G a fifth grader out of Powell Elementary in DC scores. Here it goes. I care about the community. I care about unity. I know many people don't care and some people just stare. Many people don't have homes without something simple like combs. Going days without food and people pass by being rude. Why do we have to be so mean to people who just wanna be seen and need us to create unity in order to build community? And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Brianna Russell, Executive Director of Girls Leading Girls. Prepare to be inspired. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Angela, and welcome everyone. So we are here to share with you what we've learned uh, about including leadership, anti-racism, and advocacy into our soccer programs. Um, so let me try to move this presentation down. I don't know what I did. Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay, so my name is Brianna, uh, or Coach Bree, and I was born and raised here in the Bay Area near Vallejo. Um, I'm a mixed race, uh, part Filipino, part Venezuelan, part white mix, and I identify as she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I'd like to share just a little bit about my soccer story and why I started Girls Eating Girls and then uh, Norma and Sienna will introduce themselves. So my soccer story is that I played soccer my whole life. And for me, it was an escape from life struggles, a place where I was recognized and could just be myself. I was lucky enough to receive scholarships to play. Otherwise I wouldn't really have had the opportunity. Um, after playing in college at Sacramento State, I went into the Peace Corps. I was in the South Pacific for two years on a small rural island called Vanuatu. Have you ever heard of it? Raise your hand. Um, I thought I was going to get to play football, the world sport. But when I arrived with my soccer ball, they said that only the men played soccer. Um, and I said, well, you know, if I beat you, then you have to let me play, which I did. And so I was able to continue playing. And some of the girls in the village saw me playing and asked to join. Um, I then created a team with the women in my village and we got tickets to attend a FIFA tournament that was being hosted on a nearby island. Many people in the community actually discouraged us from going. They didn't really understand why we were traveling to play soccer. We played on hot volcanic ash for three days. It was so hot, the bottom of my cleats burned off. Um, we ended up winning first place. We got a huge Wimbledon sized trophy and $100. When we returned to our village, the community was waiting for us with flowers. They heard that we won. And the girls were just so happy. They chanted and ran around the field uh, celebrating their victory. 
And it was at that moment that a light bulb went off and I knew soccer was so much more than just a game. These women were now seen as winners in their community and soccer is, and sports in general, is just something that transcends language, race, gender, class, sexual orientation, and it can be a vehicle for confidence, women's empowerment, community change, and so much more. So when I got back to the Bay Area, I uh, started coaching in San Francisco while pursuing my master's degree, and then shortly after, started Girls Sitting Girls because I, I just wanted to continue to empower women and girls like me and like the ones in my village in Vanuatu to become leaders on and off the field. Norma, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Uh, I'm Norma Sanchez. I am the technical trainer at Girls Leading Girls. I have grown up and played in the Bay Area my whole life. I was born in Mexico and I am a dreamer, which also affected my soccer career. I'm very passionate about making sure soccer is available for everyone, no matter where they come from, no matter their background. I think it should be available to all children. The more children we can get involved, the more we can change and grow our game and have more diversity in our game. But I love everything to do with soccer. I love helping out. I love making a difference and showing that we can be together as a unit. Soccer is a vehicle that can help teach a lot of valuable leadership uh, skills, but also life lessons that players can take with them off the field. But I love what I do. Uh, shout out to my Brujas team who's watching. And yeah, go ahead, Sienna. Hi, I'm Sienna Clark. Um, I'm from Richmond, California. I was Richmond in the Bay Area my whole life. Um, I started playing soccer when I was about four or five and I kind of went to comp around seven or eight. Um, and then I, I played sports my whole life. Like I started off with gymnastics, did track, soccer, tennis, um, and it's taken me a lot of places. Like I've traveled all around doing it. And so that's just a privilege in itself that you, some people may not have otherwise. Um, so I definitely thank athletics for a lot of opportunities I've received. Um, and yeah, so I'm a coach for GLD and uh, yeah, I love working with my girls. Yeah. Awesome. So let me go here. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I started Girls Sending Girls in 2014 to serve all girls. Uh, we operate in San Francisco and Oakland. We are a nonprofit that trains over 500 girls every year, ages five to 17, from all socioeconomic backgrounds and leadership and life skills through soccer with all women coaches and mentors. And we have a definition of girls, which uh, we include all girls or all gender expansive youth that identify as female. All right, Norma. At GLG, we have three core values that we emphasize in all of our trainings. They are soccer, leadership, and advocacy. We embed them throughout our practice. So some coaches like to have conversations at the beginning. They like to tie into events that are currently happening, social justice, um, and also anti-racism discussions, which we'll get into in a little bit. But coaches have liberty to embed it as they see fit as it happens naturally during practice. And yeah, those are three core values that we are super important to us and we make sure that are emphasized at every practice. Okay, so um, here I'm going to talk about basically the steps that we've taken. Um, but first I wanna preface with we are not experts in anti-racism. We are students. We are learning as we go and we're really only scratching the surface. We have a lot still to learn as individuals and as an organization. And we have a lot still to share with our community players and coaches. So I just wanna put that out there first. Um, and so here's basically what we've done uh, to 
sort of inc include anti-racism and leadership into our programs. So first, leading by example as an organization, it's important for the organization as a whole to start and lead this type of initiative. So that's, that's basically saying, is your organization speaking out, sharing information and resources, showing diversity in staff and leadership positions, showing diversity in students that are involved in your programs and making an effort to have diverse people at all levels of the organization. Um, and also, are you sharing and amplifying the stories of Black, Indigenous, people of color on your platforms? So we are doing these things, and of course, there's still more that we can do in these areas. The second step we took was we then trained our people on, on these topics and subjects and issues. We did hire help um, to, to help us create our strategy. We worked with a few consultants. Um, and then we ran various trainings for coaches, staff, volunteers to help them understand all the concepts and then how it will look on the ground. And so we started this initiative for anti-racism back in June to be actively anti-racist organization and uh, worked with consultants, like I said, to help us with our overall strategy, our communication around this topic. Uh, they gave us resources and they helped plan our coach trainings. And so we're continuing to, to do that work with various consult consultants and continuing to provide training for the people that are uh, implementing all of our uh, actual initiatives. And then the third thing we're, we're doing is we're making sure that we're leading by example on the ground, which basically just means that, you know, our coaches and staff and volunteers are acting in a way that aligns with our goals and values around anti-racism, which means, are they speaking up when discrimination occurs in games or practices? Are they using inclusive language or is it genderized or filled with bias? Are they sharing their own personal experiences and stories? And are they doing it in an appropriate and learning way? So Norma has been doing a fantastic job helping our coaches on the ground and upholding these values and helping them find those teachable moments with our players as they arise and not just letting it slide or ignoring it as it comes up. Fourth thing we did was we developed a collaborative curriculum and it, this is basically an introduction and it's gonna be built over time. It's not just a one-off event. Uh, we include it in our, our team. We include our team in the creation and continued growth of the curriculum. Uh, there's tons of resources out there that have helped us in building this curriculum. Uh, and we, we started first by just defining terms in the language for our coaches and players, like what racism means and what anti-racism means. We also used our virtual program uh, to have guest speakers join and share their personal experiences related to racism. Like we had Sammy B, who's a pro player from the Bay Area that now lives in Sweden. She shared her story with our girls about being black, a, a black pro player in a predominantly all white society. So it's important to really uplift and amplify those voices and stories. Um, fifth step that we took is we created a plan for implementing the curriculum. So we had to think about you know, how we're able to implement this curriculum. So we do some things on the field in a soccer activity format. So you can use a ball and teach these concepts at the same time. Uh, we also just have uh, group discussions on the field. Uh, we use our virtual program, like I mentioned. We send information and educational resources ahead of time to players and parents via email or snail mail. Um, and we make sure the parents are informed about the topics we will be discussing. We don't necessarily need their permission, but we are informing them that, you know, this is going to be happening so that if they decide to self-select out or if they have a problem with us discussing this, then they're not a good fit for our organization and that's okay. Um, so, but, but for us, the silence around these topics is part of the problem. And so if no one is talking about it or reinforcing what we're hearing in the news, the media, social media, then there's gonna be a massive disconnect and the learning is not gonna continue, especially for the girls and the coaches. And then lastly, we all must evaluate, measure and reiterate. So like I was saying, this is a learning process. We don't claim to know everything um, and we're constantly here to learn and improve. We gather feedback and input from our players, coaches, parents, staff, community members, donors, funders, our guest speakers, everyone. And, um, and we use that feedback to improve our overall efforts and effectiveness. Uh, we've only been actively working on this initiative for the past six months. So we have a long way to go still, but we're committed to taking action and doing the work long-term. 
So that's that. And then next slide is Norma. Thanks, Bree. And like Bree stated, the first part is actually holding space for these conversations to take place. Although some coaches might feel a little uncomfortable and might not feel like experts on the subject, we're not asking them to be experts. With coaches that maybe are having a little bit of a harder time holding these conversations and feeling confident, we've suggested to them to let the players lead the conversations. And we've had a lot of powerful conversations from our youngest team all the way up to our oldest team. And it's really powerful and it gives the players also a chance to express themselves, ask questions, to learn from one another, and to also see that this is really important to us. And it's important to have these conversations so everyone feels like they matter and they belong. Um, so some things that we did, we held discussions at the beginning of practice. Some coaches got really creative and created activities that were soccer related and maybe just had a couple different uh, rules that showed them different topics that they were learning about in an actual in-person activity, which was awesome to see. Some coaches held open discussions. They created activities on papers. They read articles. So they might've sent a link to their team on TeamSnap or email and had them read it before they came out to practice. And then they just reviewed it as a team at practice, which is really cool. Some showed pictures, some showed videos. It was really awesome to see how creative every single coach was with it, but it was also super powerful to have a document where we could all upload the activities and learn from one another. So that way we had a resource and we were learning as a group together and trying to make a difference. So the most important thing is to be authentic, transparent, and honest. It's okay if you are not an expert at it. We do not have the answer to racism right now, but by holding these discussions, maybe we can light some ideas that come into our youth that they could help us with so we can change things as they go. But it just, the honesty part as well, like coaches can say, I am not an expert at this. I too am learning. I too am unpacking some things that I didn't know existed. Um, and that's super important. And the players definitely relate to that and it's powerful, right? Uh, we created a safe space where everyone is able to share their ideas, where we could define racism, systemic racism, anti-racism, inclusion, implicit bias, cultural appropriation, microaggressions, and more. So just even giving definitions and to terms that players might not know, right, but it happens every day is super important. And one thing that I've picked up from one of the summits that I viewed is asking the five whys so if coaches do feel uncomfortable with certain topics, well, ask yourself why. Like, why do I feel uncomfortable? Well, maybe it's because of the area I grew up in. Well, why did you grow up there? Well, my parents, you know, were well-established. Well, why were they well-established? And it kind of impacts a little bit more within the coaches as well. Um, but we just shared the resources that we found and we were learning from one another in a sense. And cool. And then this next one was just examples of athletes that have used their platforms for social justice and to give um, light and attention to these issues that are currently happening in our country. I know the pandemic has given us all a chance to sit down and actually look at some of these topics that we might have not given as much attention to in the past. But one thing that has stood out to me the most is how these athletes are using their platforms, right? We all know how Colin Kaepernick used his platform in the beginning before all this attention was given to it. But his story and the way that he did is just super impactful and we can all learn from it as well. Uh, Naomi, which was the tennis player that killed it, she was using, she had masks with different names of people who have been killed by the police. Um, the WNBA, Bubba Wallace, the WNBA has been in it and has been active in social justice for years, not just right now, but right now they're getting a lot of attention. But the way that they 
were being vocal, the way they were expressing themselves before games, the way they chose not to play games when situations occurred, I think was super powerful. Um, Premier League soccer, they're taking a knee before the start of the game, right? They're making sure that they're saying we're not, racism isn't allowed on the field. Our black players matter and we're gonna show it in a way that shows solidarity with them. Uh, I know I skipped over Bubba Wallace, but he's also, he also took a stand he had the whole NASCAR racers and the people in the pit crew walking out with them in a sport that's predominantly white. And to see him use that and to see the support behind it was just awesome. Uh, the NBA also was using their platform in a similar way to the WNBA. I will even say the WNBA inspired the NBA to do some actions and to take place, right? They chose to not play games. They've worn shirts. They've spoken out um, on their platforms against, against it, which is super powerful. Uh, the women's national team recently has come out and the last game they played against the Netherlands recently, they took a knee before, during the anthem, which was something they weren't allowed to do for a while, which is also awesome that they took the time to do that and to have Black Lives Matters on their jacket, right? Um, all, with all the girls that they inspire around the country, it's huge, right? And the last example, uh, which was also recent this week was the PSG game where both teams walked off the field when there was a racial incident with the fourth official on the sideline and a coach and they chose not to play the game. And then the next day they showed up and they had banners all around the PSG stadium that said no to racism, that they support the coach from the other team. It was just so cool to see. But the powerful thing is athletes, have known that racism, racism has been a part of their sport. They know it's a part of society, but they've never used their platform in this way to bring attention to it. So I think that's super powerful. And I do feel like soccer is a great way to start battling racism within our sport. And then hopefully players can take it outside of the field and we can start making a bigger impact with the communities that they're involved in, the communities they live in. Um, but just, this is the first step talking about it, giving attention to it, and saying that it's not okay. Awesome, thanks, Norma. Make it, there we go. All right, so back to sort of just the organizational side. Um, this work needs to happen on, on three levels, and everyone needs to take action on these levels regularly. Um, and they're not sort of in order. It's, it's like a, a looping circle of the, the work that we need to do. And they are the personal level, the interpersonal level and the systemic institutional level. And so starting with the systemic institutional level as an, as an organization, we have taken steps towards anti-racism and supporting BIPOC families in our community through our free after school program, which has 95% of players identifying as BIPOC, also through our scholarships for BIPOC players in our club and summer camp programs. Uh, this has helped to eliminate any financial barriers and transportation barriers that would otherwise keep girls from these communities from having the chance to play soccer, have women mentors and learn from our programs. And then personally, we're asking all of our, our coaches, staff, volunteers to do the work on their own biases and move from that fear zone into the learning zone. Um, our junior coaches are also a huge part of that request. And we know that you know, teaching something is a great way to also learn. And so we have our junior coaches uh, involved in helping to lead these discussions and to work with the younger girls because the younger girls obviously look up to them a lot more. And so it's important that that personal work is happening continuously so that we can, we can share what we're learning with, with people around us. And so that goes into the interpersonal side and level, which is important to practice what you're learning so you can move into the growth zone and speak out when you see racism or privilege in action that is affecting either yourself or others. And it's important to know that uh, becoming anti-racist is a learning and growth process that is a lifelong commitment and that it's not an end destination. And it's something that we all have to continuously work on at a micro and macro scale. Sienna. Hello. Yes. So um, like Brianna was saying before, like 
representation diversity, very important um, aspects to incorporate at any level in any field, honestly. Um, and so what GLG has really been doing is, or making an effort doing what everybody else should be following after is seeking out women of color to coach and to lead, you know, your programs. And not in a way where we really need you, like we want to do that because it's right. It's like, you have to have a lot of intention. I think intention is one of the greatest things we can offer each other in this world. So having the right intention behind it can make it more genuine. And it just, it's a better environment for everybody. It's not an uncomfortable space because being a coach of color, um, particularly being a black coach, um, it can, it can be, a, it's a new thing um, to be in that environment with people that don't necessarily look like you. Um, leadership positions in general are often taken by white men. That is a space that they take. Um, and I don't understand why there's not more. I can understand why there isn't because it's not a space created for us. So we have to make our way, but it's kind of a community effort. So um, at, like reaching out, having targeted outreach to women of color um, to be a coach, that's something that I think would be very beneficial. Um, for my background in terms of coaching, um, I've kind of always, I've always played sports, like I mentioned before. So um, I would always kind of naturally take on leadership roles or my coaches and my mentors would naturally kind of have me step up like along the ranks as I got older. So that was something that I've always kind of been into. Um, and I've never been one that really likes a nine to five. Like I'm like a, I'm a college student also. Um, <laughs> and so I'm also just kind of like, I like to do what I like to do and something I'm passionate about or else I feel like I'm wasting my time. And so um, when I came across GLG, my friend actually was uh, reached out to and then she passed that on to me. Um, we both played soccer when we were younger and she was like, I think that we could kind of do this. And I was like, I think that would be great. I think we could really go after it. Um, and they stood for everything that I, I believed in and something that I'm a part of. Like I'm a woman of color, I am black, I play sports. Um, and I and I like to be around people that look like me and encourage people that look like me to step out of their comfort zone. And so that's everything that they stood for. So that's kind of how I got into that. Um, before finding GLG though, I was looking at other soccer clubs um, and it kind of reminded me of the kind of tense environments I was in when I played soccer myself. I was often the only black girl playing. I was often the only black person. Me and my dad were the only black people in any soccer game. Like we were the two people and it was, you know, automatically you stand out and you're kind of targeted. Um, and so it, it reminded me of that, which I wasn't, I didn't fear that situation. It was something that I was like, I'm going to take it on. I can change that. But then when I came across GLG, it was like, they want to, like, it wouldn't be a fight. This is something that we're both working on it together. Um, so that's why I got into. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have become a coach or if I wouldn't have the same experience that I have as a platform that I've been given. Um, so that's something that it, it, it creates an environment to speak on this, an issue. Um, and so something else is, um, how important it is to show the girls in the community that women of color can be leaders. Um, because we don't see it, it kind of discourages, it can discourage the girls. So it's like, why well, I don't see myself there, why well, I wanna be there. Um, for myself, how this applies to me is, I, I've come across some girls in my after school program that I've worked with and they're like, I don't wanna play soccer. Like, it's just not, I don't get it, you know? Or it's, even in our own community, like families, they. They want you to play a certain sport. Oh, you can do basketball, you can do football, or you don't need to play sport. Like, it's just things like that. There's different stereotypes that come along with everything. You don't see that in a lot of, you don't see a lot of Black girls playing tennis or soccer, or, you know, lacrosse, anything like that. And so when you break that barrier and you put yourself in that space, that's encouraging a whole nother group of people. So then seeing me and then my co-coach who was with me at the after school program I was with, they were like, okay. This is this is interesting. I don't I've never seen this before. And they made comments on it. They've made comments on it. And so that's how I really knew this is really an issue. Like they notice, like they can see, and even some of the elders at the place, they're really like, okay, black is playing soccer, got it. Or even for my own experience playing tennis, which is well, I'm from Richmond. They don't see people playing tennis from Richmond. I didn't have to pay for my practices. And I was playing against people who played two who paid two thousand dollars a month for their training and I would beat them. And so they were like, how is that possible? And it's like, just being in those scenarios, it's kind of like, you're really demeaning. You're really trying to bring me down. Um, 
but I personally never let that get to me because I've had a really strong community around me, um, but not everybody has that. So that's where you have to be, especially being a leader, being in these spaces, that the places that we hold, we have to take accountability, we have to take those extra steps to support the people around us and be intentional in what we do. Like in Kitchen, I said before, is one of the greatest things we can offer each other. Um, and so then some challenges and barriers facing coaches um, for BIPOC. Like I said before, like just the space, you know, it's kind of a new, being in that new environment and, and, and feeling kind of, oh, you're going to be the, uh, the token Black person, or you're going to be the token Asian person. Like having those things, uh, it, it can feel that way sometimes when you're, when you're asked to do things in certain roles. And so like just your approach and how you do it is, 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 is probably one of the most important things. Um, I know for, I don't know, just being a coach and being black and being a woman, it's kind of like, do you take me seriously? Um, like I can do it just as well as you can. Um, and being young too, like just age plays a role as well. And so, you know, people think you're dreaming. It's like, uh, and some people don't think it's like that, that big of a deal. People think it's just kind of like, oh, that's just you. And that's not the case. So I've spoken to other people. And, um, I've read articles and it's just, it's, it's a real issue. And you have to really take note to it and um, put effort towards it. Like if you know that you want this and you know you want that, like I want more women, I want more women of color create that space for them because you can have diversity all you want but when they get there are they going to be okay are they going to be in a space where they can thrive like are they going to be able to contribute like what you want them to contribute or are you going to limit them like you can't do that you have to make sure that you have a space prepared for what you actually want like you're asking for what you want do you have are you ready to receive it um and I think that's an issue a lot of organizations can face is they want to put a limit on it and I don't think that's necessarily prosperous um so um for reaching them and what they need to be successful like I mentioned before targeted outreach like put it in your in your um call for coaches specifically BIPOC like that's what we we're looking for like we, we think you'd contribute greatly to our organization um our aim is anti-racism and we're not just having you be a token black person like but we think you'd contribute greatly so um our efforts. And I think that's something, okay, that's how, I mean, I'm here. I felt like I had a space where I was comfortable um, and heard. I mean, I have a platform to speak on the issues that I've experienced and like people around me I've experienced. So I don't feel like I'm being used in any type of way. So I think um, just having that space prepared, like I said, um, is what would help them feel successful. Being supported, like I said, community engagement is one of the greatest things as well like letting them know you have their support. I feel supported, um, so that's why I stick around. Awesome. Thank you, Sienna. We'll end there and um, open up uh, for any questions. Uh, also, if you have any ideas or things that you're doing in this space on these topics, we'd love to hear and we'd love to learn. So um, I believe Alicia is going to lead us with the questions. Yeah, um, we definitely have some coming in. Uh, so the first question is from Sue. How do you overcome um, the cultural stance that girls should not be playing soccer? Um, for example, um, fathers who believe that girls, women should not be involved in a man's sport. You wanna take that one, Brie? Norma, you got it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think by just getting out there and playing and demanding to play is one way to get there. I do feel like that's a lot of unpacking that you have to do with that with those individuals. And it might not just be related to soccer. Like sexism is a very big thing, um, not just in sports, but in our social life. But just by getting out there and showing them that you can do it, and showing them up every time that they do doubt you is one way to keep it going, but it's not easy. Like those players would need support and to make sure that they feel welcomed with whatever team or coach that they're out there with. But like, for me, I've definitely dealt with that. And to like, it, it just kind of lit a fire under me to like play harder and to show them like I can do it. And 
to go play with the boys and to beat them and to play with them and hold my own was just awesome. So just like for me, just, it was super powerful when I just played at school, when I played with my friends outside and I was just as good as the boys or if not better, I'll say. Um, but that was super powerful for me. And then the friendships and the people I connected with also helped out when I was doubting myself or, you know, when you do hear that. And yeah, so like just being supportive and sticking true to what you believe in. Like if you want to play, you, you can play and it could take you wherever you want to go, but you have to kind of be strong and not let people get to you and stay focused on your goal. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, taking that one step further, if um, a player who would like to join your club comes up to you and just says, my parents are not going to let me join. You know, my dad says, no, um, that's not a place for a girl or woman. What, what would you say to the parent? How, how do you talk to the parent and say, yeah, of course she can play? Yeah, I think uh, I think having a discussion with them multiple times is is, is going to be what it takes, right? In different ways, multiple times, um, sharing resources with them, sharing my personal story, like your own personal story of why and how soccer has impacted my life and why it's so important. I think is is really what you want to be telling them, like the bigger picture behind soccer and what it's going to be providing for their daughter. That's going to help her into adulthood. Um, and, and where it could take her. And I think, um, and then I would say, you know, like try it out for free, come and try it out for free. And if you feel like it's not what you expect or, or it's not working out, um, you know, you don't have to continue, but at least give it a chance, you know, give everything a chance and give your daughter the chance to play. And we're here. And if you want to talk about it more, we're here, we're open to listening. And and, you know, and then I would also send some some resources to this parent mm -hmm. and keep showing them images of women breaking barriers or being excellent in the sport and beyond. Um, because as we all know, youth and women in general who play sports most likely go on to be executives and, and it, it transfers into their their job, which is ultimately ultimately going to help their their life, their quality of life. Great. Thank you. Um, this um, whoever I guess wants to answer it, I'm gonna I'll put the question out. And um, how have you handled parents who may have made a comment um, that they don't realize is anti-racist, and how do you approach them and kind of correct them? I mean, if I can chime in, um, you have to nip it in the butt. Like you can't let that fly at all. Um, because then that's just going to keep going. And a microaggressive comment, maybe, maybe, um, sorry. So sorry. Um, the way it's delivered might be in a small way, but the way it's received can be way bigger. Um, like the impact that that comment can have. You have to think about the other person as well. Just because you didn't intentionally mean to be disrespectful doesn't mean that's not how it received. You have to be very conscious of how you speak to people. Um, you don't know how long it's going to carry with it. So just nipping it in the bud, approaching them, this is not okay. And if you think that's okay, then once again, you're not in alignment with what we stand for. So we're going to need to cut ties or something, you know, just something like that. Like make it very clear. We don't tolerate that at all. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Norma, this is directed to you. Um, you mentioned the five whys. What exactly is it? And if you can expand on it. Yeah, so I definitely did not create that. And it was just something I took from another summit that I was just trying to learn from and gain knowledge from. But it really stood out to me because it can get to where this is kind of coming from. And it might not be like super apparent that you can't see it right away, but just asking why. So let's say the coach is a little uncomfortable because they don't know if their, their team is old enough to have this conversation. Okay, well, why do you think that, right? Well, maybe I'm feeling uncomfortable because I've never led an anti-racism talk. I've never been around that environment. Well, why? Well, maybe it's because I am in a predominantly white community. Why? Well, my parents, like I said before, were established here already. They've lived here, they have a house. Why do they have a house? because the system is set up 
for white people to be able to own, get loans, and then mm -hmm. continue to have houses. Why is that set up like that? Well, because the government set up these rules that are decades old that no one is, no one was questioning. And because of that, my parents were able to have a privilege and uh, trying to think of a better profit from that, right? And it breaks it down to the next step. So just asking five whys, like literal whys to your answers will kind of get into the deeper reasons. And like I said, it could be implicit, like you don't even know that it's happening, but it gets down to the actual reasoning for why you're at the place that you're at. And one more thing to add to that with players that are younger um, and just trying to learn about anti-racism, there was another uh, quote I took from a different summit that said, if our players, our black and brown players are able to experience this every day, then our white players should be able to learn about it. So that's something that I took. I love that you are learning from the summit and then you are sharing it to everyone else. So you're just, you know, the summit is just outreaching and connecting with everyone. Um, it's awesome. This question is from, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, it's Tristan. Um, I know this is a complex question, but how can white male coaches better help mentor and encourage BIPOC women who get into coaching and being a leader? Um, I feel like just from other scenarios that I've experienced and just from readings that I've done and research I've done on this, um, you have to start with acknowledging your role like what role you play, you have to reflect on yourself, like Norma said, your privilege, um, how you may come off to others, why you would come off that way, um, how you cannot come off that way, what, what extra steps can you take to be a support system? Um, it's, a, it's a lot of work. It's not something you take lightly at all. Like this is an act of work and it's not the responsibility of BIPOC to teach you and to let you know it's your responsibility. So you need to take on that role and be like, okay, how can I help you? How can I best support you? So creating that conversation, creating a space to have that conversation is like one of the first steps. Like, how do you feel I could better support you? Is there any way that you feel like you don't have the resources to uh, properly um, apply yourself? Um, and just think like, just asking yourself those questions. Um, and like, like I said before, you have to, it's your own reflection. You have to start with yourself. Um, and that's the biggest thing, honestly. Like you have to really dissect everything about yourself. You're gonna be like, oh, wow, that's, whoa. And it's gonna shock you, it really it really is. Um, but that's the way you get the best results going in all, all the way. Great, thank you, Sienna. Um, we are pretty blessed in the Bay Area that we have a diverse population. What about some of the clubs that are in areas that may be not so diverse? How how can they recruit players and get more players of color and then teach the lessons to the club? Well, I'll start and then Bree can add to it. Uh, I think it's important to have teams that are in communities of color, uh, not just in communities that are, you know, well off and financially okay I think that's a big problem like transportation and getting to these fields is an issue and then also the high costs like soccer is way too expensive it should not be this expensive for children to play soccer like it, that's one of the things that deters people from playing so I think creating more clubs that target the specific populations that we want to play uh, going to schools providing like I think it's awesome that the after school program that we have is free. So we can introduce more players into it. And then maybe they get excited about it. I'm like, hey, I can tell you about this awesome club that's close to where you live that you can come play on. And that's the next level that you want to. So we just need to create more clubs that actually target these populations in the cities that these children are at. Yeah, and I would just say, uh adding to that is like go to the community they do exist they may not be near 
<laughs> so mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to go there. You have to take the effort to go there, engage with them in their space. Like what Norma was saying, not just bringing them into your space, but going into their space, um, engaging with them there, providing program in their community, mm -hmm. and then also you know, sharing stories and opportunities to interact with players that are in from BIPOC communities that aren't near you. Um, so there's going to be some traveling that may be involved uh, and and it's very possible to do mainly before covid but you still can um, it's just going to take more effort uh, to reach them if if they're not near you or if you're in a community that's predominantly white great i like that idea that's awesome um you spoke about uh that you're having anti-racism training for your volunteers your staff and then everyone is teaching it to the girls. Are you also bringing the parents into this mix and having them get trained? Yeah, we, ha we haven't done that yet, but we plan to. So, so that one's a little bit trickier, right? Because um, as adults, we have way more years of ingrained <laughs> biases that we haven't unpacked um, and have been ignoring. And so uh, we we're definitely planning to do that. And we think the best way is to actually bring in a specialist who would lead that kind of conversation. And again, just letting people know ahead of time. So telling parents ahead of time that this is gonna happen, we're probably gonna do it over a Zoom and have it be like a workshop and letting them know what to expect so that people can opt in um, and then we'll share, you know, we'll share outcomes so that other people know going forward what it's gonna be like so they can um, also join in the next time. And so again, we're not doing one-off things, but we will, uh, our plan is next steps is to engage the parents for sure. Great. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, I've noticed and heard from players of color that referees are often um, stricter with calls and cards with players of color. Do you have any tips or strategies of how to address this either systemically or in the moment um, the run of play. Yeah, that is a huge issue uh, that I feel is not really acknowledged at the moment. I definitely have seen this myself. I I was coaching San Leandro High for the last six years, um, and my team is mostly a team of color. And the calls that we would get were, it was there was no there was no other explanation besides having some racial bias that they were bringing onto the field that maybe the referees didn't know that they were having. Um, but <clears throat> the best thing that everyone could do and not necessarily saying it's gonna help the referees, but just having the coaches lead by example when it does happen, making sure you're still talking to the referee in a respectful way. It's not yelling, we're trying to diffuse the situation, but you're also making your voice heard. So making sure that you go up to the referee and you tell them if it's a situation with players, you tell them what happened. Um, if it's a situation with the refs, making sure you make your voice heard, even if you do get a card, uh, but in a respectful manner, right? So you are showing the players when it happens that you're standing up for them, that it's not okay, that the referees need to know that it's not okay. And then from there, continuing, to, if it's, with the school team continuing to have that conversation with your athletic director, the principals, to make sure that they, whatever school that you're playing against, holds them accountable. Reaching out to maybe the league commissioners if you are in a club and making sure that they know what happened. I know one thing with referees that I've been presented with is who do you go to when the head referee is the one with the issue and there's no one above him? I've had that issue come up a lot and I honestly don't, there's no solution right now, but I really want to start something where referees get training, like on how to deescalate situations, number one, how to, uh, what implicit bias is. And then on top of that, we also need to change the whole referee system. So introducing more girls to refereeing, I think is super important growing and building an environment where they can learn and grow and progress so we can change the referees and the system that has it right now. Um, I don't think just putting a Band-Aid on it and continuing to use the same systems will, will work, um, but it's definitely gonna be a joint effort 
And I would hope that the referee president and everyone who's in charge would buy into it so we can make a change. But it's definitely a problem that I have seen come up time and time again. I agree. I mean, I think it's a double whammy, um, women and girls and then women of color and it just compounds, definitely. Um, Tristan wrote in the comments that also that another person to reach out to, that, well, he's reached out to, or they've reached out to is a referee assigner and that he's complained to them um, about racism and sexism. And this is, I think in Wisconsin. So it's definitely a problem everywhere. It is. And sometimes it feels like you're reaching out over and over and nothing's changing, right? And that's hard. But if we stop bringing problems up and we stop letting them know that it is an issue, then it's not going to change either. Right. So we have to have like, we have to be uh, persistent. We have to make sure that they hear us and we can't just let the issue go kind of like what they're doing, right? We have to make sure that they know that it's not okay. Yeah, I like your example too, Norma, from the PSG game where the referee made a, a racist comment to the coach and then both teams walked off the field and stopped playing the game. And I think it's like, yeah, see something, say something, do something. You can take action after the game. You can take action during the game. If, you, if it's really bad, you have every right to walk off. And that's, you're teaching the girls, you're teaching uh, the parents that it's not okay, it's not gonna be tolerated and that something has to be done. Um, and if that means not playing, you know, that's one of the things cause you're basically boycotting it. Um, and so I, I think that's really important. And then I would say even like sharing the incident publicly uh, just to get it more out there. So there's awareness because then more people will, will chime in and be like, oh yeah, we had that ref too. And the same thing happened because a lot of what the reporting happens when, whenever we've reported things about refs it only goes to certain people no one else sees it. And so I think it's important to, to share those stories publicly too. I agree. Um, this um, is from an anonymous attendee. Um, so much of this work, um, and I'd say trauma of dissecting implicit bias felt every day takes a major toll. What is your advice for our BIOC people and folks for their own self-care when doing this work? Um, I can answer that. Uh, I think it's super important to also take care of your own mental health as you're teaching this to youth that are dealing with this. But I think by creating that safe space, especially right now with everyone being virtually or not being able to go to school in person and having those social interactions, giving, them, giving your players and your team a space to express themselves and to be vulnerable and to share and to learn from one another is super important. You have to give them that space to express themselves and to maybe share their own personal stories. And that's gonna help teach everyone else around them also who might not have to deal with that situation. So holding the space, giving them time to talk, and it doesn't have to be every single practice, but making sure that you do hold space at some point during your week for players to just emotionally release anything that they have is super important. Great. Do you have any um, suggestions for, oh, I'm sorry, go Sienna. Oh, no, it's okay. I was going to say, um, like, you know, don't be the dead horse. Like, don't, you'll have to bring it up every single day, especially right now in, in our society with everything going on, which it's always been going on. It's just, we actually have attention on it now because we're forced to recognize it, which we needed to do anyway. But that's a lot of trauma every day every single day, every time we turn on the TV, every time we go on social media, every time we open our phone, we have a notification reminding us of how we're mistreated as people. And um, that's tiring and it, and it, and it does hurt because it piles up. It's like, okay, I'm being reminded, I'm being reminded, I'm being reminded and just constantly having it in your face, um, it, it becomes a fragile situation. So making sure that you're like checking in with these people, you need to check in. Hey, don't be weird about it. <laughs> just check in. Hey, I just wanted to, I know there's not a lot going on. Like, are you okay? Like, you want to talk about anything? I'm here if you need me. I also understand if you want to kind of be left alone. Like, just understanding, like, however they need to deal with it is how they need to deal with it. Um, and don't force it down their throats because it, it's all about um, preservation, right? We have to preserve ourselves. We can't always be fighting. It's like I said before, it's not necessarily our responsibility. Um, 
to constantly teach people. Thank you. Um, we'll have time for a couple more questions, and this is a, a this is a a little bit of a heavy question, I think. Um, and um, this is a question um, I hesitate to um, bring up into the conversation because it breaks my heart to see, hear, and feel the biases within the BIPOC um, community, but it's real and I think it tears apart our power and community at large. In training, how do you deal with biases between peoples? Norma, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, uh, I think like even within communities, right? There are biases that need to be broken down and just continuing to hold people accountable to make sure that you're letting them know that whatever they're saying or their beliefs are not right. And then maybe helping to educate them a little bit more on the actual issues and why what they might believe might not be completely correct, right? And it goes down to systemic racism. Um, you know, our communities have always been told to kind of go against each other and not really come together but I think when we do come together and we do learn from one another that we in fact make each other stronger. And that's, I feel like if like our whole society did that, like what a difference we'd have in our government and the people who lead this country, if we came together and instead of picking at each other, we helped raise each other up. Like what a different world we would have. So just continuing to hold, hold them accountable for what they do say, and then just helping to educate them a little bit more. I agree, definitely. Um, Bray, did you want to add anything into that? No, that was perfect. I mean, yeah, making uh, the invisible visible. So like really showing them that what they're saying is offensive or uh, is breaking apart these communities that could be working together, like Norma said, and then educating them on why it's important for all of us in, in these communities to help lift each other up. Um, and to make progress as a collective. It's not a competition, it's not a race. Um, it's, it's really a collective effort. And I'll add one more thing to that. Like it could be just with small actions within like the people who are immediately around us, right? When things happen, letting them know it's not okay, helping to educate them as well. And then hopefully they go out and they educate more people that are around them and it just keeps growing and growing and we do hold ourselves accountable and we show each other the right way to do things so i could add one more piece too just like as a reminder like um in doing this work and bringing up these conversations like you're gonna have to step on toes like you're gonna have to be in very uncomfortable situations and mentally preparing yourself to go into that is i think the best way you can be successful at it um, if you're not a confrontational person, that's going to have to change a little bit. You don't have to be rude about it, but you have to be vocal. Like if you want to make change, you have to speak about it. You have to support what you stand for. Like you have to be very outspoken. Um, and it doesn't have to be in the most crazy way ever, but just always stepping up and stepping out, um, and supporting yourself. Like you have to be your biggest supporter too. Like even as an athlete, as a mentor and as a leader, like you have to be your biggest supporter. So if I stand on this and this is what I think is best for the situation, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Sienna. Well said, well said. Um, <laughs> I, this is such a um, difficult topic to talk about and discuss. And I think you've all done it so gracefully and really taught us a lot and I, it's so inspiring to see how your girls are learning from you. Um, so I'm gonna put this last question that we've put to everybody, um, all the speakers. And Norma, I think you already know what I'm gonna ask. Um, so this summit, we're bringing together top leaders in the soccer community and we're learning from each other and sharing and we want the betterment for the game for women and girls. Um, so what do you see for yourself personally and for the community at large and what we can do in the next five to 10 years? Um, I think I'll start with Norma because <laughs> I just know she's ready. <laughs> I was ready for this question. Um, but for me, it would be to have soccer be almost free for everybody, not paying to play so we can help take down some barriers that go with go along with having the privilege to be able to pay high fees 
every couple uh, months in the year, um, getting more women involved in the game. So in refereeing and coaching and uh, admin positions higher up. It, one thing that I took from uh, Heather O'Reilly yesterday was even like going into the men's field and coaching men like that. Like I've coached boys before and I had a great time. Um, so not just limiting our options to just coaching women or just working with women, like we can do it all and we can show them that we can do it just as well, if not better. So just having more free soccer available for more women of color so we can add more diversity, especially in our national team um, and get more girls out to play. Fabulous. Sienna? Um, yeah, like Norm was saying, I think resources is the biggest thing. I mean, as I've seen with my after school programs that I've worked with, introducing them to the game has led to some amazing things. Like they, we have our uh, games on Saturday, or we did have our games on Saturdays. The show out was incredible. Um, their entire family came. They brought their siblings, they brought their aunts, their cousins. Everybody was out there. It was a big community event. We had food. Um, and some girls are, are really, they're high level soccer players. Um, I mean, if they had the resources to be a part of a club, I, they would probably take it by storm, honestly. I've seen some crazy things from some seven-year-olds. And, um, and it's really incredible that they haven't had the, the training, right? Necessarily the training. So I think just providing the resources to our communities that are deprived from it is the best thing we could do. Um, yeah. Thank you. Bree. Yeah, I mean, well said by Norma and Sienna. Um, I agree, free soccer, free sports, mm -hmm. all sports for everyone. Um, women playing in male sports. So we're seeing that happen with football in the NFL, but in all positions, uh, I don't know if that's gonna happen in five, 10 years, but uh, it, it's changing. Um, yeah. Equal coverage in media. So more of women's sports being mm -hmm. played in media. I think that's a huge problem. Whenever I try to find games, I can't. Uh, equal pay at, at all levels. Uh, so if you're a coach, if you're an athletic director, if you're an athlete playing in the professional league, equal pay, um, equal number of women coaches, refs, uh, team owners. Uh, Angel City is amazing. I, I'm so happy that's happening because all of the people that invested are women, like huge step. We need more of that. We don't want it to be the exception. It's going to be the rule. Uh, same with CEOs. Um, Women coaching men, like Norma said, equality in diversity of race. So 50% or more uh, people diversity participating in all these levels, um, equality in girls and women playing. And then I think this one's a, a big one that is going to take time, but like changing perceptions uh, that men and women have about women being leaders, being equal, BIPOC women in all levels of society. And we can do it through sports. Sports is such a great vehicle because it's so male dominated and we can prove a lot through sports. And so it, that's a starting point. But then I'd love all of this to go out into every sector of society. Great, thank you so much. Um, this has been such a, a wonderful discussion and all three of you are wonderful leaders. And thank you for uh, Girls Leading Girls for participating today. Um, I wanna to thank everyone in our audience for coming and um, our partners, Goal 5 and Women in Soccer. And we have two more sessions today, um, one at, oh my goodness, 1 p.m. Pacific time. And our last one's at 3 p.m. And the 3 p.m. we're taking, wrapping up everything from the week and bringing it together. So hopefully everyone can come to the last two sessions. Um, Hoping everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Stay safe and we will um, hopefully see you soon. And um, Brianna and Sienna, if you could stay on for us for a moment. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Just a second.